You ready, Ed? Yeah, I ain't He's not going to rumble, but you're ready. Okay, that's <laughs> I don't know, Ed. I think you got some rumble left in you. Don't, get, don't, don't cut yourself short there. Well, anyways, we are in Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and go there. And we're going to take a look at, we're still in Abraham and his journey with God. And I, I want to talk this morning. I'm really into this because I think we can learn quite a bit this morning about Abraham and God and about us and God. I'm going to specifically talk this morning about a personal relationship that each of us have with God. Now, we pretty much decide how personal that's going to be, okay? We, we decide how close we're going to be to God because God is willing. God is all about relationship. And that's one thing we learn as we go through the Bible. We see God with these people, men and women, um, young and old. And, and I love to look through these relationships and learn. Man, there's so much to learn from them because they're just like us. And we're going to see today, and, and we're going to know for sure that Abraham and Sarah were just human beings struggling with this relationship with God. They weren't superhumans. They weren't glow-in-the-dark figures. They were people just like us. So that's important to understand. So if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 15. Now... Let's take a look at this from this perspective. God has called Abraham out of his home. He and Sarah took their stuff and they headed to Canaan. They didn't know where they were going, but they arrived there. And they knew, Abraham knew that God was going to bless him. He was going to bless all nations through him. He was going to make his name great. And, and so those promises in Genesis chapter 12. Interestingly enough, as you and I consider the promises that we have from God, and we have quite a number of promises, so many I think we wouldn't even know where to start or end because there's an abundance of promises. But just like anything in life, when somebody tells you something that you, you love to hear, isn't it interesting how it fades? It, it becomes less audible to us. As life goes on. What I mean by that is somebody can tell you they love you. And that mean a lot at that moment. But how long does that last before you need to hear it again? Just think about that for a minute. I love you. Okay. That's great. But I love you lasts how long? Gail. <laughs> she wasn't ready for that. I love it. I love it. <laughs> It depends. It depends on a lot of things, doesn't it? Who's saying it, right? What do they follow it up with, okay? I'm sorry. I just had to do that. So I've got my Gail and Ed thing out of the way, so we're good now. <laughs> okay. That'll wake you up, though, won't it? Hear your name in the front of a class? Woo! Okay. All right. Anyway, sorry about that. But I was just saying that God told Abraham this, and time goes by, and things don't exactly line up with the way God described it. In Abraham's mind, I'm going to bless you, make your name great, and all this stuff. And immediately, he gets there and there's a famine. What I'm saying is that you and I have to learn to trust God in a de degree that allows things to happen that don't make sense. The trust that we have with God, it has to be stronger than anything else we have in life. We have to put God Number one in our lives, and keep him there. We can't allow God to sink. Because once God sinks, and we talked a little bit about this last week, and something else takes its place, we're in trouble. Because that thing that takes, or person, or whatever, that takes that place of God is vulnerable. It can be destroyed. It can be hurt. It can be killed. And then where are we? So God has to be number one. This is not a theory. This is practical. Abraham was learning this, and so do we every day that we live. In chapter 15, this relationship with God is so crucial, and I want us to read a little bit to help us see how it happens. In verse 1 of chapter 15, it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. What a declaration. Does God give us that same declaration? He does, doesn't he? Is God our great reward? Is he our shield? Do we know that? Okay. Even though God says that, and he tells us that, we sometimes doubt that. We sometimes struggle with that. 
What's Abraham's response to that in verse 2? This is so important. O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Okay, it's important for us to follow this. This conversation has a lot to do with us. I know it was thousands of years ago. But this is, remember, remember, we're talking about these questions we have. What do I learn about God from this? What do I learn about me from this? What do I learn about my relationship with God from this? This is crucial. Because Abraham is saying, after God just told him, I am your shield, your great reward. What's his first question? Then why is this happening? This is a theme throughout. Gideon is a great example. All the raiding that the Midianites were doing, and an angel appears before Gideon. Boy, what, what that must have looked like. And told him, man of God. Gideon said, if God is God, then why are all these things happening to us? This is a theme through the Bible, and it's a theme for us too. Because the trust in God is crucial. So Abraham says, even though just three chapters ago, <laughs> I like to put it that way, a couple chapters ago, God told him, I'm going to make your name great. I'm gonna, you're going to be a blessing to the entire world. He says, then wait a minute. You haven't given me a child, and my whole household's going to go to an heir. Look at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. Oh, I'm telling you. Listen, I know it's easy for us to say, well, that's Abraham. God is talking to him audibly. He can hear his voice. That's different. I don't get that. I don't have that. Well, let me tell you something. That's true. We don't have that, but what do we have? Let's stop for a moment. What do you and I have in us that Abraham did not have? Thank you. The two things, boy, I love it. Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Boom. Boom. Abraham had neither. He had God's audible word. That's all he had. Abraham couldn't refer to Ephesians chapter 2 and say, but wait a minute, Ephesians chapter 2 it says he didn't have that. He didn't have the Holy Spirit living in him like you and I do. So, so we, we kind of think this, this man had an advantage. Not really. Because you and I have to let our faith be what guides us, not circumstances. And Abraham's battle in the same battle. And I'm telling you, as long as this earth is spinning, it will continue to be the same battle. Because we are finite people. Get this, folks. Don't ever forget this. this is, I, I have to remind myself of this every day. I am a finite person serving an infinite God who I cannot see. There's going to be some issues with that. Folks, we have issues with people we can see and talk to. If I go to, you know I'm coming at you. If I go to Buddy, he's just cringing, and I say, Buddy, you said something the other day I didn't quite understand. Wouldn't you want to know what it is? Sure, okay. And I say, well, Buddy, you said A, B, and C. Oh, no, Kelly, you misunderstood. I didn't mean C. I meant D. Oh, we shake hands. Thank you. We're good. But there's going to be times, if, if Buddy and I spend enough time together, that we're going to have some issues. It happens in every relationship in life. Okay? If we have these kind of issues with people we can see and talk to, aren't we going to have a few issues with a God we can't even see? Who is infinite in nature? Who can see the future thousands and thousands of years down the road that we cannot see? Great example of this is things that happen in this life. We only know them now. I'm telling you, all this stuff is stuff that just swirls around my head all the time. We are so focused on the here and now. We only see what happens today. We have no idea the impact that people make for the future. We don't, we don't even consider that most of the time because we can't see the future. But yet God does. And we don't understand things. Things happen in this life we don't understand. People pass away, people get sick, people go through tragedies. And we're thinking, how does this stuff make any sense? And that is what keeps a lot of people from becoming Christians, folks. Is that how could a good God let bad things happen? Have you heard that one? 
Yes, it's all over today because people think God must line up with what I consider good. Well, God doesn't have to line up with anybody, does he? (laughs) Because he's God. But I really believe when we get to heaven, we are going to be amazed at what God did through the tragedies, through the difficulties, through the struggles to enhance his kingdom and glorify him. So Abraham, I love this, what God does next. This is so important for us to take time on this, okay? In verse, where are we at? I'm sorry, I get out of control here sometimes. Okay, in verse um, five, he took him outside. Just look at this, folks. Please soak this up. He took him outside and he said, look at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. This is the precious nature of God. God could have demanded that Abraham believe him and be insulted that he didn't. When you and I struggle with God, when we struggle to see things, when we struggle to make sense of life, do you think that God turns his back on us and and just scolds us for our ineptitude, our, our lack of faith? Is that your view of God? I sure hope not. See, one thing God does understand far beyond us is he understands our struggles. He understands that we are finite and that we don't see all he sees. Abraham didn't have a clue where God was going with this. And when Abraham said, Lord, I don't know why I don't have a child. How can you say my name's going to be great? My heir is going to be in my family, not me. And God takes him outside. You know, this is something that I've learned to do. And I'm thankful because, as you know, I'm a little wiry. Okay? I'm a little wiry. I, I don't rest well. I never sit. Rarely ever sit. It's enough for me to sit in this pew. Okay? But it's got cushions, so it's okay. But I'm telling you, you can ask my wife. I'm always on the go. In our house, literally. Should I tell them? I have a figure eight In our living room, dining room, it's small, but it's in our kitchen. I do this constantly. I walk it constantly. Ask her. When she has a conversation with me, she knows, here he goes. Okay, but I'll be back. (laughs) I'm constantly on the go. I just don't know what's part of me, what God, I don't know if God shocks me, but, but, but I'm telling you, and I was talking with a brother about this the other day. I don't even remember who it was, so that's funny. Okay, might be somebody in this room. But we were talking about how God wakes us up sometimes in the middle of the night. You might say, I don't know if that's God. I think that's other things. That <laughs> wakes me up in the middle of the night. But whatever. I, I, I'm oftentimes a 4.30 in the morning walker. Now, I know that's nuts because Patty tells me, don't go out that door till at least 4.30. She tried to push me to 5, but I'm not doing that. I'm like the neighborhood guy. You know, if anything happens in our neighborhood between 4.30 and 6, I'm a witness, okay? But what I have learned is in those times, I have great communion with God. I'm telling you, the sky at night, early in the morning like that, right now Jupiter and Saturn's out, it's beautiful. And I'm telling you, what I've learned is that this is awesome. He took him outside. Folks, there's sometimes we need to just get outside and we need to let God speak to us through all this wonderful creation he's made. Stuff that we don't normally even look at and let him assure us through all of that that he's with us, we are precious in his sight, and he has a plan. Whether we understand the plan or not, whether we get it or not, it doesn't matter. The God who made the universe loves you and me. And that relationship is something that we need to work on, nurture, enjoy. Abraham's learning to trust God, and God takes him outside, okay, and says, look at the heavens and count them. This is going to be your offspring. And look at verse 6. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is a relationship that's forming. Just like you and I all have this opportunity. But if we don't see it and don't understand it, that the Holy Spirit is in us, God is so close to us that through Jesus Christ, he has made himself a part of us. Folks, listen to that. 
God, the universe he made, all the things he made, the spiritual heavens and beings that you and I can't even see, he became a man and through his spirit indwells us so that he can walk with us and be with us, comfort us, take care of us. That is a M-I-R-A-C-L-E. It's a miracle of God that he did that with human beings. I don't understand it. I'll never understand it because I know me. I don't deserve that. I'm a mess. But God doesn't care because he loves you and me. And he will deal with messes. He's been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. So look at that relationship that's forming there in, in chapter 15. Anybody got any comments about this? There's got to be some thoughts here that somebody would like to audibleize. My wife, always the clutch. My ways are not your ways. That tenderness of God in that example of taking him outside to show him, look, just look up in the sky. If I made all of that, I can bring you a son no matter how old you are. And that, that's, yeah, that's good. Anybody else got a thought on this of what this might mean to you? Yes. Death Valley, California. Wonderful place to visit. Never want to live there. Yes. And I was there when the UFO comet hit Ooh. right here. And seeing it here and seeing it in Green Valley, I mean, it just brings it because the stars look like they're right here. Yes. Death Valley, but they're so dark and there's no light. There's, there's nothing out there, there yeah. They're like the stars right here. Mm -hmm. And I, I never want to live there because I, I feel like there's no hope. Yeah, there's comfort when we see God's nature like that. It, it, Bring, because that God adores us. It does take your breath away. Anybody else? Why do you think he does that? Do you have any thought as to why he keeps telling him that? Yes. We need reassurance and reminders. We're human beings. Not only do we forget easily, we get discouraged easily when things happen. And God, that's why the word of God is so important to us is because we need to constantly be looking at it to remember the things God wants us to remember. But yes, Sarah's right. There was a constant reminder God kept coming at him and saying, hey, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And in this example here in chapter 15, we see it loud and clear that God's telling him, look, I know it doesn't look like it right now, but it's going to happen. Anybody else? Okay, so let's move over to chapter 18. What I'm doing right now is I'm looking at a couple of things where you see this relationship with God between Abraham and him, and, and Abraham and God. So we, we have this idea that, that God is becoming more known to Abraham, and Abraham is, is getting more and more comfortable with this relationship with God. And in chapter 18 is a big one, because this is when the visitors come and, and, and uh, foretell of, you know, basically what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and there is a lot of stress in Abraham right now, because... Who's in Sodom and Gomorrah that Abraham's very concerned about? Lot, right? His nephew. So he knows that if, Ab if, if Sodom and Gomorrah goes up in smoke, <laughs> what happens to his, his relative? Again, I love this stuff because it's all real. It's, it's, it's things that we think about. when. How many of us think about the future of our country and the direction it's going and get worried because what's going to happen to our kids and our grandkids. 
It's one thing to say, well, I may escape before any of this, before anything bad happens, but what about them? And, and I think that's the same thing that Abraham's feeling here. He knows Sodom and Gomorrah is being disobedient, and he knows there's going to be trouble. So he makes this great plea with God. In chapter 18, starting in verse 22, most of us know this dialogue, but it's just ph phenomenal to me that Abraham felt this comfortable with God. In verse 22, when the men turned away and went towards Sodom, Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Anybody got a thought as to why God started at 50? Anybody got a, have you ever thought about that? Where would you have started? I might have started with five. Because the thing is, that's where he needs to get to. Because he knows that Lot and his wife and daughters are probably it. As far as righteous people in Sodom. But I just, I know this is kind of a trivial matter. But it's like Abraham is starting this process to kind of, I think, to kind of see where God is on this. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, really think about it. What if you find 50 people, would you, would you hold off for 50? He knows where he's going. He's got to get down to the real core, but he's, he's talking to God. I love this. This is relationship building. He's finding out where God is on these things. I, I, I love it, okay? So he goes on and he says, okay. And then he comes down and he says in verse 26, If I find 50 righteous people, God said, in the city, I'll, I'll, I'll spare it. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of, of that? If I find 45 there, God did the math. I love it. This is just, to me, this is just precious. God, it, this is the eternal God who is the Lord of heaven and earth, creator of everything that's ever been made. And he is discussing numbers with Abraham. Please understand, we're learning about God's nature. He doesn't mind small talk. God loves a person's heart. And if our heart is where God wants it to be, he'll, he'll walk with us. He'll deal with us. Then he said, what if only 40 are found? God said, for the sake of 40, I'll not do it. May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He said, God said, I'll not do it if I find 30. Abraham said, well, how about... Um, can I be so bold as to speak? What if 20? For the sake of 20, I'll not destroy it. And then Abraham says in verse 32, Let the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found? And he said, For the sake of 10, I'll not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. He stopped at, he stopped at 10. Were there 10 righteous people in Sodom? But Abraham got the point. What's God's meaning in this incredibly odd conversation? He's a merciful God. God would not just bring Sodom and Gomorrah to an end just because he felt like it. God is doing this because this city has become treacherous. They have become rebellious. They aren't even listening to reason. And he's telling Abraham... I know how many righteous people are there. I got this. Because Abraham did not go so far as to say, well, what about my nephew, wife, and two daughters? Are you going to take care of them? God let him know, I got this. To me, that speaks volume to me. How many times have I been in my situations in life and I have been in tears or I have been at the edge of my my edge of my life thinking I'm never going to be able to endure this I can't get through this whatever it is we're going through and I hear God say I got this those are precious words I can read a story like that that's the same God we serve amen there's no difference than that God and the God we serve that's him and he's telling him I got this he tells us the same thing and we need to believe that even if we don't understand it. Anybody got a comment on that particular passage? Be still and know that I am God. That's a great verse, isn't it, Edith? It's...
Yes. Great stuff. Let's look at that real quick, what you were just referencing. Verse 17. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Yeah, I love it. Yep. And, and remember, Abraham was a man of God who obviously had some issues in his life and some struggle to trust. But let me ask you this. In terms of us being able to relate to this and take this to our hearts, A, did Abraham have the Holy Spirit in him? No. Did Abraham have the Word of God? No. Did Abraham have all the promises of Jesus Christ? In essence, yes. But he didn't know it yet. Because the grace of Jesus goes forward and backward from the cross. But I'm just saying he didn't have that assurance of a relationship that we have through Jesus. That God doesn't, and this is the thing that we have to recognize about the way God set up this redemptive plan, which Abraham was told early on, you're going to be blessed. I'm going to bless all the nations through you, which is Christ. Okay, that's the blessing of the forgiveness of the covenant that's coming. But basically what you and I need to recognize, and this is the tough part because we have voices that are telling us this isn't true, is that God doesn't see us. He sees Christ in us. Please understand the difference there. It isn't about you and me. We don't have this relationship with God that we enjoy because of things we do. Titus 2, great example. This grace that's been given to us, not because of anything we have done. Okay, we talked about that last week in the lesson, in the sermon. But this is important for us to recognize because people say, well, how can God put up with me? How can God continue to walk with me when I have all this mess in my life and all this? Because he's not looking at you. <laughs> he's looking at Jesus in you. That's the difference. So we have confidence, as the Hebrew writer says, to enter the holy place, to, to approach God. Why? Because we have Jesus. And that's an, a phenomenal reality. Anybody else have something on that? Okay, let's turn back to uh, chapter 17. We're just going through a few things here on this relationship. Okay, this is important too. You and I have all these different aspects of a relationship with God that are constantly working, constantly, we are constantly cultivating them. This one is something that I, that I noted that I thought, okay, this is worth calling out. In chapter 17, or chapter, um, yeah, 17, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and greatly increase your numbers. Sarah, there he goes again. See, he's, he's doing this again. He's assuring him that I am going to increase your numbers. You are going to be a blessing, okay? Verse 3 is important. Abraham, Abram fell face down. I just want to stop there for a second. Abram understood the holiness of God. He understood the awesomeness of God. Even though he didn't understand everything that was going on, he worshipped God because of God. We need to, to be better at that. We need to be people who worship and are in awe of God simply because of God. Because he's worthy. He is and always has been and always will be the God of the universe. I know we know that theoretically, but does that ever dawn on us to just simply take a moment in a day and maybe get on our knees, whatever it takes to just be in awe of God for a minute and just forget everything else, forget the traffic, forget jobs, forget family, forget whatever it is that's just fog in our view and just see God as God, not worrying about whatever else. Abraham has plenty of problems at this time in his life. He has plenty of uncertainties. He has plenty of questions that haven't been answered. But when God comes before him that day, he falls face down because he recognized the nature of God. That's all. I just brought that out because that's part of our relationship we have to have with him. We have to just stop sometimes and praise him for being God, for being this incredible creator and sustainer. 
And then, of course, that can lead to other thoughts like if, I, if it wasn't for him, where would we be? I always say dead or wishing I was, and I know that's true for me, but what about you? Would you be dead or wishing you were if it wasn't for God? That helps us focus on what's real. So the awesome power of God and his nature is part of that relationship, that personal relationship, is that we respect God. There is a healthy fear here. Now, if you know me very well, you know that I do not believe that fear should drive our relationship with God. I don't believe that. Because fear, obedience with fear as its number one ingredient only lasts for a little while. Take the nation of Israel, for example. When God appeared to them and scared them, they would be obedient for how long? Until they got hungry again. But when love motivates our faith... And there is a fear. There is a respectful fear involved in that love because God is God. You know, he controls everything. We do have that embedded with us. But when our decisions and our faith and our everyday life is motivated by the love of God and how much he has done for us, it's a much better motivator because it lasts for eternity. That's the difference here. What Abraham's learning here is how much God loves him. That's what he's learning. And it's a process that we all have to go through in our lives to understand that more and more. Again, I'll just throw this out. When I was a freshman in college, I took physics. Does anybody like physics? Chad Mullins, are you a physics guy? No. Um, Roger Baby, physics? Eh, okay. Well, most people endure it. Because you got to take a science to get through college, okay? Well, that was my, my thing was I had to take physics. You know what I hated about physics? Theory, theory, theory. This guy would stand up there and prattle on about some theory that I would never apply in my life. And I thought to myself, why am I here? Because i got to pass this class to graduate. Okay, but here's the deal. Faith is not theoretical. We have to remember this. There are theories in faith, but that's not what our faith is. Our faith is based on practical application of God's love and grace. When we understand the difference that all these theories love one another, forgive your brother or sister, don't say bad things, blah, blah, blah. And we have all these things and all they are theories, and we don't put them to practice. They are irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. If you've got a person going around, I'm a Christian, but they're cussing like a sailor, they've got a problem. They're not applying the theory of speech that's laid out for us in the New Testament. If you've got a person that's got a grudge that hates somebody, that's a, a theory they've not applied. And I know it's hard. I'm not sitting up here saying, oh, piece of cake. You know, No, I'm saying this stuff is tough. But that's why Christianity is a faith approach. It's a faith-based approach to life that we take these principles and we just don't say, yeah, we need to do this. No, we go after it. And we allow God, we allow God to test us because that's what life is. It's a test. You know, these ideas that we see, we've got to be willing to put them to practice. You get angry? How many of you have a, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but we have some people in life that are long fusers. It takes a while before they, boom, okay? Then we have medium fusers. How many of you know a short fuse person? There's Ron. <laughs> Are you talking about yourself? Okay, we have a confession. All right. I love Ron Baker. Known him for years. Great, great friend. And I love his honesty. But here he is, Ron. You know that that's part of it, right? You got to control that temper. Well, if Ron just said, okay, it's a theory, but I'm not applying it. Boom, boom, boom every day, right? Yep. But the thing is, what I love about this relationship that we have with God is that it's practical. Because every day we're going to have things that are going to push us, that are going to force us to decide every day who's in charge, God or Kelly. Every day. I have them every stinking day. <laughs> and I have to be able to say, is this real or is this just in a book? And man, I love it because God loves me and he loves you. And he's saying, I want your whole heart. And guess what? 
what is, what are, what's an adjective that's used, especially in the Old Testament, about God? God is a jealous God. Does that kind of sound odd? What does jealous mean? Ow! Give me a definition of jealousy. Okay. Anybody else have a definition of jealousy? That's definitely true. All for me, right? Jealousy can destroy people. It can absolutely destroy people. But God's a jealous God. And what he means by that is, I want all of you. I didn't die on a cross to get a quarter of Kelly Campbell. I died on a cross to get all of Kelly Campbell. And if I allow him into my life, this stuff means so much to me because I can look back at Abraham and I can see this relationship and say, I got you. I know what that's like. I know where you are. And this relationship allows me to move forward. Anybody got a thought on that? I shouldn't say a thought. I'm pretty sure we all have thoughts on this. But does anybody have a comment? All right. Okay. I want to bring out something right now that lets us know that Abraham and Sarah were human. Chapter 16. This is when Sarah has had it. <laughs> she has waited and waited and waited and no baby. She knows the promise that she was given by God. And look what happens in verse, uh, chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, boy, I love these details. How long had they been there? 10 years. How long had she been waiting for a baby? 10 years. Nothing. So Sarah t his Sarah's wife took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. Okay, is that true? Let me ask you, whose fault was this? Hers? <laughs> okay. Now, ladies, why would you blame your poor husband for that? Would any lady like to say something in defense of Sarah? What? You got to blame somebody, and he was the easy target, right? Maybe she, <laughs> you think she was hoping it wouldn't work? Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Boy, she turned on him quick, though. Anybody, any, any, anybody else? Yes, Al? Remember, Deborah's in the room. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. She, <laughs> okay. Yes. Interesting. That's a great comment. Reuben. Okay. <laughs> Say that again. Oh, okay. Now, Kimberly is within hitting distance, so I wouldn't go too far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, it, but it is interesting that I'm just saying this proves how human they are. Okay? Let, let's, let's get into this and understand that these are people struggling to, to trust God, to understand. Yes, Al, right answer. He should have said no. Wives, 
How many of you would want your husband to say no to that? <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. All right. You're squirming back there, Al. I appreciate that. No, it's true, though. Think about it. He should have said, could have said no, but he went along with the plan. And that helps us see a little bit more about them, about the struggle that they are having. We got about, yes? He wanted children. She wanted children. Yeah, she did. She served it right up, didn't she? Uh-huh. Yes. And, and, and they did want to do it their ways rather than God's ways. And that is a big problem we all have. But let's take a step back and let's understand, did they have some legitimate concerns? Sarah's getting old. Yes, Dennis. Yes, Dennis. How much what? Grief. Grief. <laughs> we'll get to that next week, bro. <laughs> But anyways, this relationship is great, and I hope, hope you're enjoying it. I know I am diving into this, looking at some of these things closer than we typically do from a relationship standpoint. Next week, we're going to maneuver our way from, from Abraham and, and move into Isaac. If you don't have um, of this, that Isaac is uh, chapters 24 through 28. So please read between now and next Sunday, chapters 24 through 28, um, as well as if you'd like to... Go back and do a little bit more uh, Abraham work because we got a little bit more to do on that. So we'll get to that next week. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for hanging out with me. I hope we're, we're working something here that will help us all get closer to God. Love you all. Thank you.